Good afternoon. In this edition, I'll be joined by solicitor and advocate Bala Subramaniam Silvam and Emeritus Professor Dr. Dr. Shad Salim Farooqi, Professor of Law from UM, about the recent Nagendran case in Singapore and hopefully to get their perspectives as well on the death penalty. I'm Jesse Chahel. You're watching The Brief. Moving on, an update on our Prime Minister's visit to Indonesia. Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob is scheduled to meet Indonesian President Jokowi Widodo at the Istana Bogor today to discuss several matters of interest. In fact, I think us here at Bernama TV have brought you some footage of that meet that's happening right about this time. He's also indicated on Twitter that several MOUs and agreements between both countries will be signed uh, at this meeting. Those were some of the statements from the Prime Minister. Now, moving on to the Parliament, here are some further updates. According to the Day One Rakyat Deputy Speaker, members of Parliament who have yet to receive their COVID-19 booster shots can do so tomorrow. Shots will be administered from 9am right up to 1pm at the Parliament clinic. Now, the Health Ministry has admin administered the first round of booster shots for MPs on the 2nd of November. Here's a quick reminder. Booster uh, doses uh, beginning nationwide, uh, or rather did begin nationwide on October uh, 13th for fully vaccinated individuals. It's mainly to ensure that immunity is maintained and uh, especially, of course, against um, the different variants of concern, uh, the main one at this point being the Delta variant. Now, despite a mandate issued by the Public Service Department, about 1.8% or around 28,800 civil servants have yet to be vaccinated against COVID-19. The Minister and the Prime Minister's Department of Special Functions told the Dewan Rayat earlier today that no disciplinary action has been taken against these unvaccinated individuals. He's affirmed that there are at least seven different punishments from civil servants who refuse uh, the vaccine, but also has stressed that due process must be observed at all times. Now let's move on to a case that, of course, is uh, you know filling up all our news feeds and one that is important and that needs attention and discussion around it as well. A court in Singapore has put on hold the imminent execution of a Malaysian drug smuggler who campaigners say has limited mental capacity. Nagendran Dharmalingam was scheduled to be heard, hanged today for attempting to bring a small amount of heroin into Singapore two years ago. Go. The case will be heard again by the Court of Appeal uh, come Tuesday on the grounds that Mr. Nagendran is not of sound mind. Uh, more than 60,000 people have now signed a petition calling for Singapore's president to pardon him, citing the fact that executing a mentally ill person is prohibited under international human rights law. The movement has gained attention from the UN and even British billionaire Richard Branson. Now, here's a quick note that Singapore has one of the harshest laws against drugs in the world, which includes capital punishment. At this point, I'd like to bring in advocate and solicitor Bala Subramaniam Silvam to dive deeper into this whole situation and give us better understanding, perhaps, of some of the punishment around a death penalty and how that uh, can be executed as well. We'll wait till I bring in uh, my guest at this point, Bala Subramaniam Silvam, to be joined in our discussion right here on the brief. I'm just speaking to the production team at the back end, if you could just very quickly bring in my guest uh, for today. Okay, we will move on to our next guest, a very important guest. I've spoken to him before and it's always a privilege to speak to him and hear some of his thoughts as well. Uh, Dato Shad Salim Farooqi, Professor of Law at University of Malaya. Uh, Prof, welcome to the program. It's good to speak to you again. How are you doing, Prof? Thank you very much, Jesse. I'm doing fine given all the circumstances, but there's a lot to hope for and to That's plan right. for. 
it does seem that all we have to uh, hang on at this point is is hope, and that really, you know, uh, you know, goes across so many different important uh, issues that that we have at hand. But let's look at um, the issue of Nagendran at this point. To date, 140 countries have abolished the death penalty uh, in law or perhaps even in practice, demonstrating that the desire to end capital punishment is shared by cultures and societies in almost every region across the world. Prof, can you give us an overview? View of the death penalty globally, and then of course here in Malaysia. Uh, thank you very much, Jesse, and good afternoon to all your listeners. Uh, I agree with you that there is a growing tide around the world uh, questioning the morality, the legality, and the utility of the death penalty. And I'm happy to say that the tide has reached our shores. I, I must offer some qualifications and clarifications on this movement to abolish the death penalty. First of all, I wish to point out that the debate about um, death penalty is fixated uh, at two extremes. There are those who call for the total abolition and there are those who call for um, the status quo, the retention of the law as it is. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Jesse, there are 17 offenses in this country for which there is death penalty. And out of these 17, nine attract the mandatory death. Now, this count of 17 or nine may vary because in the drug law, there are many drugs for which there is mandatory. So what, it depends on whether we count drugs as one or marijuana and hashish and heroin all separately. So there are about 17 offenses, nine are mandatory death. Now, my personal view is that middle paths are available. If we understand these, the support for reform and change in the law will be enhanced. First of all, uh, one middle path is this. Instead of calling for a total abolition, we could ask for the removal of the mandatory nature of the death penalty. At the moment, nine offenses are mandatory. Nine crimes uh, are subject to mandatory death, and there are eight that are non-mandatory. I think judges should have discretion to fit the penalty to suit the crime. So that's one qualification. Uh, we concentrate on removal of the mandatory nature. Secondly is reduce the number of offenses from 17 to lesser. Uh, for example, um, 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 offenses which are of a political nature, uh, drug offenses, gun offenses could be removed from the death penalty roster. Perhaps the death penalty could still be maintained for mass killings, for terrorism, for genocide, for rape and killing of children. So in Prof, this area, are you of the opinion, Prof, if I may just, you know, sort of squeeze in here, are you of the opinion yeah. that as we have progressed as a society, that we should also now move away from some of the classical viewpoints of, of, of how some of these uh, uh, crimes are, are, are viewed? And do you think perhaps in this modern era right now, there should be more flexibility around some of these laws without compromising on you know, uh, ensuring that uh, the, the rule of law remains a uh, yes. priority. I agree with you. The law cannot stand still. Life is always larger than the law. Times change. New developments are there and the law must keep pace. I uh, fully agree that contemporary morality has to be taken note of. At the same time, please do bear in mind that it is not reasonable to tell people to forget their culture to forget their religion, and uh, I think we will all agree, uh, and to tell people whose life has been devastated by some brutal killing by someone on one of their loved ones. It's not reasonable to tell them to forget it and take note of uh, um, current morality. So I think what I would recommend to you is, while I agree with the abolition, I think we need to go for evolutionary changes rather than revolutionary changes. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out to you is that uh, 
many people who oppose the mandatory uh, death, uh, who oppose the death penalty, are nevertheless themselves perpetrating it or supporting it in extra judicial situations. Uh, and some of these situations actually are more heinous than death penalty after due process. Let me give you some examples. International law allows wars of self-defense. International law allows. Now, you'll agree with me. Wars, all wars, result in massive killings. Killings of innocent people. The Charter of the UN permits wars of self-defense. Um, most countries allow police powers to permit the extinguish, extinct, extinguishing of life in certain circumstances. Even in the so-called best of democracies, police, uh, the special security services maintain death squads. Um, in the United States, for example, targeted killings uh, in the name of uh, war against terrorism are allowed through drone attacks. In many right. societies. Um, well, yeah, I, I do see some of the points you're making, but let me just bring you back to uh, what we, uh, you know, want your view on at this point of time, because it's so important. Tell us a little bit about the Nagendran situation uh, in Singapore. Yeah, well, the situation in Singapore is this, that in Singapore, like in Malaysia, um, there is a death penalty mandatory for drug offenses. And after due process, he was found guilty. The extenuating circumstances that he is a person of diminished mental capacity, which should also mean diminished uh, uh, responsibility. Uh, also, the other factor is this, that he has already suffered a number of years since his first arrest. And uh, um, I think that could be taken into consideration. Um, I was going to point out to you later on, I'll do it now. I think some categories of persons should not be subject to death penalty. One of them should be people suffering from psychological or other such uh, disability. And it seems to me, um, though I do not know uh, the medical situation fully, I think he's suffering from some such disability. So I think his is a case for a, not a pardon, he's a case for uh, reducing the penalty that has been awarded to him. And what do you think might be some possible outcomes? Um, as we know, of course, uh, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, push from the ground to to bring this issue up to light to to save him uh, from, um, you know, um, being prosecuted. Yes. Well, I, I, I personally think not just in his case, in other cases, uh, the drug trafficking law with the mandatory death penalty is severely defective in this respect, that it basically catches the mules. But those who are really behind the crime, they are extraterritorial. They are not in the land and actually they get away with it. There are many other things that one can point out uh, which are an objection to the death penalty. Uh, one is of course the trend. You correctly pointed out that a very large number of countries are moving towards abolition of the death penalty. Uh, may I also point out, in international law, even for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, tribal by the International Criminal Court, um, the maximum penalty is imprisonment and not death. Drug offenses around the world are not regarded as sufficiently serious to warrant the death penalty in most countries in most countries. And the other factor that I hinted on just now is this, in most cases, it's the poor, the poor drug mule that is being caught, whereas actually the real perpetrators are going scot-free. There are problems of we corruption. We appreciate your time and thank you so much for weighing in and shedding light a little bit about some of the laws around death penalty. Uh, do stay safe and we hope to speak to you very soon again. Okay. That was Professor Dato Shad Salim Faruqi, Professor of Law at University of Malaya, weighing in a little bit on um, some of the perhaps uh, new 
thinking around death penalty and what uh, that would also mean uh, perhaps uh, for Nagendran. Now here's a bit of news in brief. Let's start with the groundbreaking revelation that the use of medical marijuana is permissible in Malaysia. Health Minister Kairi Jamaluddin says it does not violate any laws but the medicine must be approved firstly by the government. Now, from marijuana to alcohol, the Negri Sembilan Menteri Basa says the government has no plans to impose new restrictions on the sale of alcoholic beverages within the state. He says the current rules, which include banning Muslims from purchasing these beverages, are sufficient. And Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department of Religious Affairs says the cost of performing the Hajj is expected to be known by early next year. And moving on, the Malaysian Fire and Rescue Department is expected to install two additional sets of life-saving appliances in every state beginning next year. The kits will be added to the 27 existing kits nationwide and can be used by rescuers during emergencies. And still on the topic of fire, the Housing and Local Government Minister, Dr. Sri Rizal Marikan, says more fire stations are needed in the country to reduce emergency response time. The ministry has requested for 14 more stations to be built. And in other news, the Deputy Minister for Women, Family and Community Development, Dr. Siti Zaila Muhammad Yusuf, says that the number of divorce cases in the state of Sarawak exceeded 5,000 during the MCO period. And finally, the Human Resource Ministry is looking into the need for a law, especially to regulate gig workers and protect their welfare. So far, gig workers only receive social protection and so-so. And here's an update on the vaccine. According to the Health Ministry, 95% or over 22.2 million of Malaysia's adult population have completed their COVID-19 vaccination as of yesterday. 97.6% have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And for those aged between 12 to 17, 76.7% are fully vaccinated. We move on to international news and what's trending globally. Uh, we shift your attention now to climate change. Analysts working on the CAT or CAT Climate Action Tracker has warned that the world is on track for a warning, really a warming of 2.4 degrees Celsius by the end of the century even if countries fulfill their pledges at the COP26. This is far beyond the UN target of 1.5 degrees. One of the organizations behind the CAT is Climate Analytics. Let's hear what, what its CEO, Bill Hare, has to say. We found that there's a massive credibility action and commitment gap uh, with the warming uh, that countries' current pledges for 2030 are taking us towards at 2.4 degrees. Glasgow is meant to keep uh, the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree limit in sight, but the 2030 emissions uh, gap is still so huge that we can't really see that being possible at present. Um. I'll start off and then uh, anyone else can join. There's a great diversity within these updates that countries have. Well, staying with the climate, EU climate policy chief Franz Timmermans pledged 100 million euros to the United Nations Adaptation Fund, which offers we finance to, to developing countries that are vulnerable to climate change effects. Act on adaptation as well. Financing adaptation is critical. We all repeated that mantra endlessly, but the rhetoric, sadly, is not followed by action. And we all need to do it now. That is why the European Commission will contribute 100 million euros to the adaptation fund, because those who need resources for adaptation also need to have predictability and clarity about its delivery. To the parties pushing for more ambition, I say this, you will find the EU on your side. To the parties stopping and stalling pro progress, I say, what are you waiting for? Science tells us we're out of time. Extreme weather events show us the consequences everywhere on our planet. To everyone here, I say, let's overcome our differences. 
and find solutions this week. Moving on to the Sri Lanka food crisis, a decision by Sri Lanka's government to ban imports of chemical fertilizers and move towards 100% organic agriculture is just one season has pushed farmers across the country to protest. Now, in May, the government announced that it would ban all imports of chemical fertilizers, including pesticides, weedicides and fungicides. The president said that this was to promote healthier agricultural practices and, of course, sustainability. Farmers have waited for instructions on how to shift to organic farming, but the promised assistance never came. The decision could reduce Sri Lanka's paddy yield by 40%, bringing food security even lower. In response, the government has imported limited amounts of potassium chloride and liquid nanonitrogen bottles from India. And with that, uh, we bring this edition to an end. Thank you so much for uh, watching. And just some happier news uh, to share with all of you. Malala Yousafzai, advocate for girls' education and the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, has gotten married. The 24-year-old announced the good news on social media. She took to Twitter and shared some pictures to announce it. She tied the knot in Birmingham with Asir Malik, uh, who is an operations manager for the Pakistan cricket board. Well, thanks for tuning in to The Brief. I'm Jessie Chahal. Take care and I'll see you soon.